This is worship for Sunday, March 7th, 2021. And the drama for today is Pilate's Investigation, Who Is This Jesus? featuring Procula. Good morning. Welcome to worship on the seventh Sunday of March, um, 2021. It's the third Sunday of Lent already. And we want to welcome you this morning. Today, if you're joining us online, that's wonderful. We're also going to have our first in-person worship this morning at 9.30. Um, it should be a brief service, and you're welcome to sign up and join us. If you haven't done so already, we still have a few places left. Um, tonight, we have our third session of our book study, You Are Never Alone. If you purchased the book and haven't joined us before, this is a good one to start with. We'll be looking at the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus joining the disciples on the storm-tossed seas by walking across the water. If you joined us on the first one but didn't meet, join us last week, I encourage you to come this week. Um, our Zoom problems were fixed last week, and we just have some really interesting things to talk about, so I hope you'll join us. With all that being said, let's just take a moment to gather our hearts and minds for worship and hang, have the ringing of the bell. The Call to Worship From Water to Wilderness God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. On stone and in hearts. God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. From the ancestors of nations to the sun lifted up. God's covenant continues. God's kingdom comes near. We follow Jesus on the Lenten path. For where he is, we would be also. There is so much during our days that clamor for our attention. Friends, family, work, classes, household tasks, and the noise. We are bombarded with sound from the clock that awakens us in the morning to the telephone, the radio, the television, even the conversations that we have are over here. Where is the time and place to listen for the still, small voice of God? Sometimes it seems that God would have to speak in a whirlwind to be heard above the clamor. Listen now. There is a place of quiet rest where we can be still and hear God speaking God's truth for our lives. Close your eyes. Be aware of that place. In Lent, we journey to the parts of ourselves known only to God, beneath the clamor. Let the story of Jesus reach us there. Let it teach us wisdom in our secret hearts. As we extinguish this light, we acknowledge the noise and the distractions that keep us from following God's will for the world and for our lives. Let us pray. Draw us together in your love, O God. May our restless hearts not resist you, but continue to search until they find their rest in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
the order for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The epistle reading for today is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Human wisdom versus the cross. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but it is the power of God for those of us who are being saved. It is written in scripture, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will reject the intelligence of the intelligent. Where are the wise? Where are the legal experts? Where are today's debaters? Hasn't God made the wisdom of the world foolish? In God's wisdom, he determined that the world wouldn't come to know him through its wisdom. Instead, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of preaching. Jews ask for signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, which is a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. This is because the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks. be to God. Are you ill? It's already the fifth hour, mid-morning. You also slept late yesterday. I know. The night seemed to grow longer and longer. I didn't close my eyes until the clock crowed at dawn. You can't keep on like this. You must see a doctor. How can a doctor help? More massages, more medicine? Be truthful. What's the matter? After midnight, I wake up from the same reoccurring dream. Now I'm afraid to sleep, afraid that the dream will return. Why won't you tell me about it? Describe it, and when you finish, you'll be done with it. Get it out in the open. Your foolishness is not important. Nothing to it. That's easy for you to say. You're never troubled by dreams. True. I do do what is right. Let the chips fall where they may. What if you make a mistake? How can I? If I follow Roman law, plain for everyone to see. But mistakes can be made. Seldom. 
We Romans believe in justice. Our statue of justice wears a blindfold that symbolizes that we judge impartially without favors to either side. I know justice wears a blindfold. Maybe she can't see the real truth either. And I will ask you, what is truth? You tell me and I'll shout, my wife is the wisest person in the whole world. Truth seekers like Socrates either die frustrated or are killed by their followers who no longer believe in them. If I only knew the truth, what can I believe? I've tried so many things. I sat for hours in the temple of the Egyptian goddess Isis. I kept my eyes closed and inhaled the perfume of lavender candles until I grew dizzy. Nothing was ever revealed. Ah, uh, yes, I also remember the Jasper Stone. Did you sleep with it under your pillow? Or hold it in your hand while droning that um, um sound? I thought that silver charm from Ephesus would work while I sat among the lilies. Instead, I felt a bee sting. Nothing <laughs> works. I can't discover any truth about myself, or the world, or God. Put all of that behind you. Enjoy life. Get a good night's sleep. But I had a vivid dream last night. There was a big crowd, almost wild, running in the streets. <laughs> There's a simple explanation. The Temple Bank had a riot. Order was restored by early afternoon. You dreamed about it. Forget that. You're safe here. No, this was different. The crowds parted and a man came down the street. A street magician? An entertainer? What kind of man? No, he was the rabbi from Nazareth who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Remember? I told you all about what I saw. I can't get him out of my mind. Ah, that one. You must face the truth about him. Now he's in real trouble because he was involved in that bank riot. We can't let things like that happen. He'll run back to Galilee. Maybe he's left already. Forget about it. I can't. In this new dream, the rabbi was bent over. People threw stones at him. They jeered and spit on him like a common criminal. It was terrible. I feared that they would, he would be killed or maybe even crucified. Who said anything about being crucified? Be strong and forget it. I know what a good rabbi he is. I saw him help a cripple at the Pool of Siloam. I heard how he rescued a woman of the streets from a crowd that wanted to stone her. He even healed the centurion's daughter. You know about that. Ah, uh, yes, he was lucky with that trick. Please, Procula, don't be difficult. You have a big heart. I have to keep the emperor's peace. I can't listen to a soothsayer or a country rabbi. Everything else is secondary to law and order. Promise me that you won't let anyone hurt the rabbi from Nazareth. His name is Jesus. He is a holy man. Let others make a mistake, but you, please leave him alone. This is a strange land. Many prophets have been called holy. This Jesus is another self-proclaimed prophet. But there is no Roman prophet like him. The Romans have gods for everything. Bargain hard enough and you may get your wish. None of that means anything to me. Apollo, the sun god, or Venus, goddess of love, you money, get a favor. That doesn't work for me anymore. Be careful, Procula. You're close to denying that Emperor Tiberius is a god. That's dangerous. I can't help you if you follow that rabbi. There's no humility or awe when Roman gods are worshipped. Jesus calls the Jewish God his heavenly father. That is so comforting. I want to claim him as my heavenly father too. So you think you found something better than our Roman gods? I only know that the rabbi makes me think about faith in the God of Israel. I want to hear more about him. If you listened, you would know that Jesus speaks the truth about many things, helpful things, that let us live life to the fullest. Promise me that you'll listen to Jesus, too, or else leave him alone, because I repeat, he is a holy man. I can't promise anything. I accepted this post, and I take orders from the emperor himself. That is my duty. I must keep the peace, no matter who lives or who dies. Even if Jesus dies? Yes, but I'll never meet him. 
The temple authorities will deal with him first. Forget all this. Let's have a special luncheon in the garden and feed the peacocks. Only if you remember what I ask of you. If Jesus dies, it will be because of people like you and me, weak, sinful, ordinary people who refuse to accept his truth, who refuse to speak up for him. Oh, Lord God of Israel, help our unbelief. How can I deal with her, with anyone? Caiaphas wants the rabbi banished. Herod Antipas wants to be king of the Jews. Now Procula believes in Jesus and expects me to save him. The list keeps growing. Can, what can I do? Well, no matter what happens, I will keep the emperor's peace at any price, even a man's life. But who is this Jesus? The Holy Gospel appointed for this third Sunday of Lent comes to us from the Gospel of St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus in Jerusalem at Passover. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were selling cattle, sheep, and doves as well as those involved in exchanging currency sitting there. Jesus made a whip from ropes and chased them all out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins and overturned the tables of those who exchanged currency. He said to the dove sellers, Get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered then that it is written, Passion for your house consumes me. Then the Jewish leaders asked him, But what, by what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous sign will you show us? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jewish leaders replied, It took 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. 
Well, that was another great drama this morning. I especially appreciated Donna Loney's interpretation of Procula, the wife of Pilate, the Roman governor who is charged with overseeing Jerusalem. As you know by now, in our third week of doing this, I'm a huge fan of Andy Purvis's interpretation, that is how he has chosen to play the role of Pilate. He has all that smug bravado, I think, that a man such as Pilate would have. Underneath that bravado, however, I think there is a man who is curious and searching, wondering about who is this Jesus of Nazareth. And I always think that men and women who come off with a lot of cocky self-importance, I think they're often hiding kind of beneath the surface if they would if they would be honest, a great deal of hidden vulnerability, maybe even insecurity, at least maybe some questioning about their place in the world. And if they truly deserve this place of power from which they rule their fiefdom, whether that be a Roman province like Pilate or a boardroom of a Fortune 500 company like, oh, let's say Mark Zuckerberg. Well, lies beneath the surface of these people. Now granted, when you rule in a world where a misstep could cost you your head, the dis-ease that one would feel at times would be infinitely greater than one would feel before an annual shareholders meeting. But I think you get the idea of what I'm talking about. There's stress. Clearly, Pilate and Procula were a couple under a lot of stress, and at least Procula was admitting to it. Her cries of sleeplessness caused by her bad dreams about the famous rabbi getting stoned after she herself saw him heal the man at the pool of Siloam after she heard that he had rescued a woman from being stoned, after both these events led her to view him favorably, she wanted no ill treatment of Jesus. And Procula wanted to know the truth about this new rabbi before she lost her mind. She wanted to know the answer. Who is he really? Is Jesus truly sent from God? What is the truth about him? The truth about her? The truth about God? And I think Procula is on the right track. She realizes that this truth is to be found in Jesus. And truth be told, we will never know whether she found her way to the truth. That is the way, the truth, and the life that we have found in Jesus Christ. The drama, of course, ends before we ever know of any conversion for her. But yet and still, I can totally, totally relate to her. The last place, I think, that Pilate and Procula will expect to find the truth of Jesus is on the cross. And we know that that is just the beginning of the truth for our lives. We have to look at the cross. The wisdom of God that Paul spoke of in our passage from 2 Corinthians today. This is the truth which Proculus seeks and it's a real mind bender. Paul writes, but we preach Christ crucified which is a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. This is because the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. What is this wisdom that we know that is such foolishness to the world? that our God is found and understood best in the cruelest of torturous instruments, the cross. The truth is this, and it's a big truth. We have a cockamamie faith that makes no sense by the standards of this world. It was interesting to me. I was listening, as I am often wont to do as I'm preparing for a sermon, to a podcast about the text for today. And I'm listening to some of the finest minds, at least I consider them to be some of the finest minds of biblical exegesis 
And I'm listening to them trying to explain the idea of this theology of the cross, we call it in Lutheran circles, which is what we're talking about here. It's a key underpinning of Lutheran theology. If you want to understand God, look no further than the cross. Easy enough. But what comes after that? What does that mean? So what? What do we do with that? And so I was listening to these esteemed academics basically turning themselves into sort of knots, pretty much saying nothing about the theology of the cross, at least to me, so that I could say something meaningful and I really wanted to say something fresh to you and it was really frustrating. I could find nothing that they were saying that I wanted to hang my hat on. I wanted to tell you and I wanted to tell Procula, truth I'm sort of thinking about her as a real person, and here is the truth, a truth worth giving over your life to. And then, that's when I met Father Emil Capone on Friday. And meeting him moved me like I hadn't been moved in a long, long time. So let me introduce you to Father Emil. He was um, introduced to me in this grainy wartime photo from the 1950s. It was a photo of four men in the Korean War. And all four men look positively miserable. They're in the rain, looking as miserable as only men, combat soldiers, can look. Now, one man was back in the background, gone erect, scanning for the enemy. Two other men were in rain-soaked ponchos and uniforms that stuck to them as they struggled through the mud, helping a wounded compatriot to safety. He is seemingly wounded, possibly wounded in the eyes, for his hands are like this, protecting his eyes, and they are leading him off the field of battle. One of the two of them has a gun in his hand, but the other one of them has no weapon at all, save for a white cross on his helmet that indicates that he's a military chaplain, which I guess in its own way is a kind of a, it's kind of a weapon. Anyway, this man was our Father Emil Capone who hails originally from Kansas and who served ultimately, as we meet him in this photo, with the 1st Cavalry Division in the Korean War. So eventually, in November of 1949, his military unit was overrun by Chinese forces. And while those who were healthy in his division were ordered to retreat from the field of battle, Father Emil, the chaplain, stays behind Calm, calmly walking through the enemy fire to, pro to provide comfort and aid to the wounded who were laying on the battlefield and who were being left behind. Those who didn't die there, like Kapoun, were captured and taken as prisoners of war by the Chinese army, and they began a hellish period in captivity. As you might imagine, Father Emil Capone gave his all to serve his fellow soldiers in captivity. Among other things, he made pans out of roofing tin material so that the men could safely boil drinking water. He stole food so that they had more than the bird seed that they were offered daily to eat. He worked hard to persuade those who actually got their hands on food and who were hoarding it to share their stores. He washed the underwear of those who were taken ill. And on Easter Sunday, March 25, 1951, he donned a stole much like this one to hold Easter Mass publicly for his fellow soldiers. And it was just two months later in May that Father Emil Capone would die of exhaustion, malnutrition, and pneumonia there in, in Korea. But his legacy among the soldiers in the camp lived on. 
and they would regale each other with stories of his escapades and his life-saving actions. He was a real and present being with them, so much so that when one newcomer, Jerry Fink, a Marine Corps fighter pilot arrived, he remarked later that stories of Capone was all he heard about. So moved was he by these tales that he set to work immediately almost, collecting firewood, firewood, and he began carving what ultimately was a four foot crucifix of Christ with radio wire used for the crown of thorns around the head of the crucified Christ. Many remarked that strangely, the Christ looked much like Capone's own visage. Fink would later tell reporters, if the meek shall inherit the earth, it will be because people like Father Capone willed it to them. You see, I am a Jew, Fink said, but that man will always live in my heart. What made Fink carve the cross at such great personal risk while in the POW camp was the story of a man who rejected hate, who told people like Jerry Fink to love their enemies. Fink admitted he had a hard time, a difficult time emulating Capone, but Fink could risk his life to honor Capone's ideal by carving the cross while being held captive. And when he and his prisoners were ultimately freed from captivity, their Chinese captives we're not going to allow them to take their crucifix with them. But those men refused to leave until the crucifix was released with them as well. On April 11th, 2013, after some 60 years of them recruiting and cajoling for this, Father Emil Capone was awarded the Medal of Honor by President Obama. It was even previous to that, in 1993, that he had been named a servant of God, servant of God by Pope John Paul II, and started working his way to canonization. But it was on Friday of this week that Emil Capone's remains were identified, and he will be returned to his family. But this is the truth. It is safe to say that he has rested safely in the arms of God since 1953. Father Capone lived out the foolishness of the cross in his life and in so doing, gave life to so many. Father Emil followed the example of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross, thereby transforming an ugly instrument of torture into the instrument by which God worked out the wondrous salvation of the world. You wonder if Procula was watching that day when Christ was crucified so that she could discover the truth of God's love for her, the truth that's contained in the foolishness of the cross. Amen. Let us profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, 
and all in need. There is no God before you. Purify your, the faith of your church, that we as your people place their trust in nothing beside you. Your name is holy. Guide your church, that in every situation your people's words and actions honor your name. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill leaders with the foolishness of your peace and mercy. Your law defends the vulnerable. Work through legislatures, judicial systems, and systems of law enforcement to protect the well-being and freedom of all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering. We especially pray for Nancy Chase, Lynn Schmelick, Bob Kirk, Nancy Johnsick, Mary McKenzie, and Lynn Felt. We offer prayers for Amanda, CJ, and Logan Clark, Mary Jothies Dietrich, Gail Harper, Mike Dorer, Jay Compagna, Julie Neer, Pat Lombard, Todd Holly, Amy Maxim, Dorina Stark, Almeida Uskert, Margaret Bile Amstutz, Bill Anderson, Mary Tallinger, Phyllis Walschek, and Mike Barnes. We also lift up the families of Bob Carr, who passed away on February 22nd, and of Tom and Nancy Brosick on the passing of Tom's mother on February 19th. Give Sabbath rest to all who labor and care for those who are sick, infirm, and dying. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You call us to proclaim Christ crucified. Give clarity to this congregation and our leaders so that we might follow Christ beyond our own habits and comfort. Clear out anything in our common life that would obscure the gospel or that serves our own interests. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. The cross of Christ is your power for all who are being saved. Thank you for all who have gone before us whose witness reveals the power of the cross. Give us the same trust in life and in death. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We entrust we have... ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer as our Savior taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now receive the benediction. You are what God made you to be created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, free to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.